want to welcome everybody joining us online. Crossroads Recovery, we love you guys. We're praying for you guys. Give it up for Crossroads Recovery. And, and the Peoria campus, I love what God is doing in and through the people of the Peoria campus. And it's, they're incredible people, incredible, amazing volunteers over there. And I love what, they're just on fire for God, on fire for what, what is happening in that community, in that neighborhood. And we're, it's not just a campus anymore. It's a community. It's a family. And I love what God is doing. It's been so much fun. But we're in this two-week series on forgiveness. Last week, we talked about how can I forgive them? How can I forgive other people? And so if you haven't watched that message, please go back and listen to that message. Uh, Pastor Dan talked about taking the long walk around because we know this, sometimes hurt people hurt people. And sometimes hurt people hurt us. But the opposite is also true. You see, forgiven people forgive people. Because God first forgave us, we are able to forgive others. Because God first loved us, we're able to love other people. And we're able to take the long walk around to be set free from our anger and see things from their perspective. To move from anger to empathy. So hurt people hurt people, forgiven people forgive people, and forgiven people forgive themselves. And that's what we're talking about today. So today we're going to answer the question, how can I Forgive myself. Maybe it was something you did. And the guilt and the shame just won't go away. You made a choice that you can't take back. You hurt someone, someone that you cared about. You hurt your family, your career, your image. Maybe it was, it was a divorce. Maybe it was an addiction or a, a DUI or, so, or something with your kids. Something that you hurt someone and you just you wish you could take it back, but you can't take it back. And now you're living in a space of shame or regret. Now, when I talk about forgiving myself, technically you can't really do that because uh, you didn't really like sin against yourself. But he, when I say forgiving myself, here's what I mean. Forgiving myself is not living out of who shame says I am, but living out of who God says I am. Amen? All right, so here's the difference between guilt and and shame. Guilt says, I did bad. And shame says, I am bad. I am bad. So guilt, in this sense, can actually be a positive thing. It can actually move us toward healing. Here's what I'm talking about. So guilt can be a gift. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says this, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow, this, this feeling of guilt, this feeling of conviction, like, I can't believe I did that. But when we bring that to God, he is safe and he is good and it leads to repentance, it leads to healing, it leads to life, and it leads to a life of no regret. How many people want to live a life without regret? Me too. My goodness, I want to have that kind of life. But worldly sorrow brings death because shame brings death. A little over three years ago, my mother-in-law, Betsy, was diagnosed with early-onset Alzheimer's. A year later, she moved in with us because she wasn't able to live on her own and didn't have the finances for a care facility. Now, it's been a privilege and an honor to care for her during this time. It's also been one of the hardest times our family has ever faced. Last September, she moved into an assisted living facility because her decline was so much faster than we thought it was going to be. It took us by surprise. And last week, her caregiver called my wife and told her that we're near the end. Uh, Could be a week, could be a month, but we are, we're there. And so we're filled with so much uh, grief. We're grieving. And, but as also as we approach the end, I'm processing over the last three years of our life and I'm asking questions and I'm kind of evaluating myself and our choices. And, like, and so I'm asking myself questions like, did we make the right choices? Did we do the right things? Did we do the best things? Did, did I honor my mother-in-law well? Did I honor my wife well? Did I honor my kids well? And those are really good questions to ask because I always want to be in a space where I'm always growing and I'm safe to do that. But here's what happens. Here's the temptation that I fall into, and I believe a lot of us fall into that because it's so easy to slip into this. Here's what it sounds like. Did I honor my mother-in-law well? Am I a good son-in-law? 
Did I honor my wife well? Am I even a good husband? Did I honor my kids? Am I even a good father? Do you feel how easy it is to slip? Because guilt says, I did bad, but shame says, I am bad. But shame isn't healthy, and it's not where God wants to be, and it's, God doesn't want that for us. So today we're going to look at Peter. If you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, turn with me to chapter, Luke chapter 22. We're going to be there in just a minute, Luke chapter 22. I love the disciple Peter. He's, he's like my favorite. I love watching him follow Jesus because he makes me feel so much better about myself. Because Peter, he's, he's bold, he's courageous, he steps out. In some instances, he's a great leader, and in other instances, he does really dumb stuff. And I'm like, thank you, Peter. I don't have to be perfect to follow Jesus. I'll, thank you so much. And in Luke chapter 22, at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is around the table with his disciples, and he's at the Last Supper. He's at the Passover meal. It's the last meal that they're going to have before Jesus is crucified. And he looks around the table, and he's like, my disciples, I don't even call you disciples anymore. I call you friends. I love you guys so much. And he tells them that he's going to die. And it's not the first time they've heard this from Jesus. He's been saying it a few times now. He says, I'm going to die. But then he says something else. Every single one of you will desert me, will abandon me. And he doesn't say it out of frustration or, or guilt or conviction or anything like that. He, he says it just matter-of-factly. Like, this is, guys, this is just what's going to happen. I want to give you a heads up that you're going to run away in the moment of crisis. And I love Peter in this moment because Peter basically stands up in the midst of that really tense moment. He's like, yeah, not me. Jesus, I know all these guys, they might run away. Not your boy. I am with you to the end. I'm your guy, ride or die. I am in this thick and thin. I am your man to death. I got you. And Jesus just looks at him. Oh, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And then Jesus says this, but Peter, you're going to get back up. And when you do, strengthen your brothers. Take care of them. So here's what we read in Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Here's where we pick up the story. Jesus has been arrested. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him to the house of the high priest. And read this with me. Peter followed at a distance. So much in that little sentence. Peter followed but at a distance. You see, he was still following Jesus. He still had eyes on Jesus. He could probably still hear what Jesus was saying, but he was following Jesus at a distance. And I wonder how many of us, myself included, tend to follow Jesus, but from a distance, where it's comfortable, where it's safe, where it's convenient. We're following Jesus from a distance. And here's what happens next. In verse 55, and there were some there who had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, and they sat down together, and Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. So Peter has moved from a space of comfort and now has lied about who he is, about his, his association with Jesus. In verse 58, a little, little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are, are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. Oh, now he's getting defensive. You feel it? He's, get, he's getting a little... Ha when someone has called you out on something, especially if it was like a little bit true, you ever get defensive? Anyone? Okay. Yeah, me too. Um, so Peter is in this moment, and now he starts to get defensive. He's moved from being following Jesus at a comfortable distance to lying about being with Jesus to now being defensive about lying with Jesus, all because he was motivated by fear. Man, fear is motivating, isn't it? Fear can motivate us to do some, some really strange things, things that we never thought that we were capable of doing. Fear can motivate us. Because of fear, my four-year-old might have to get creative about how he wipes his bottom, which, let's be honest, is already a struggle. Because of fear. Fear can motivate us to do some pretty intense things. But you know what? So can faith. Faith can motivate us to do things we never thought that we were capable of doing on our own. 
Can we move from fear to faith? In verse 59, about an hour later, another one asserted, Certainly, this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And if you read it, if you read the account in Mark, Peter actually starts swearing. He starts cussing this person out. So he's moved from being comfortable, he's moved from that into lying about who he is, to being defensive about what's happening, and now he's just angry and cussing out this guy. What happened? And it all started because he was following Jesus from a distance. You see, he could hear what Jesus was saying. He could see what Jesus was doing. But he wasn't close enough to Jesus to hear Jesus speak directly to him. And if he was near enough to hear that, I think he would have heard things like, Peter, you are my guy. I don't don't care what you've done. You're, You're not the worst thing you've ever done. You belong to me. You are a son of the most high God. You are still my guy. I see you. I see everything that you've ever done and everything you're going to do. And I still love you, Peter. But he was following at a distance. He was following at a distance. I'm a child of God. I am not my sin. But then just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turn. I'm going I'm to read this again. I'm going to read it slowly, and I want us to enter into this. I want us to hear it, and I want us to imagine ourselves there, and I want us to feel it. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Can you feel it? And I, don't, I imagine what Jesus' face looks like, and it's, it's, it's bruised, and it's beaten, and it's bloody. And when he looks at Peter, it's not a look of, of condemnation or anger or frustration or disappointment or like, I told you. It wasn't like that. It was a look of sadness. Not, not sad because Peter disappointed him, but sad for Peter's heart because he knew what Peter was about to wrestle with in that moment. He knew how Peter was going to have to step out of fear and into faith and and step out of shame and into his identity, but it was going to be the hardest thing that Peter had ever done. And even in that moment, I believe that Jesus is looking at him with love, seeing everything that he's ever done. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And then he went outside and he wept bitterly. This this word wept bitterly, it's so much more than crying. It's this upheaval of emotion. It's it's crying and it's it's weeping and it's loud and it's snotty and it's ugly crying. And You ever cry so hard you feel like you're going to throw up? That's it. He's outside and he's weeping bitterly. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I hurt that person. That's not who I am. I'm so guilty. I'm so ashamed. Guilt says I did bad, but shame says I am bad. And now the enemy has you right where he wants you. Pastor Craig Rochelle said it this way. Shame is the enemy's playground. See, the enemy can do a lot of things when we're in this space of shame. He wants to push you past the guilt and into the shame. Peter, I can't believe that you would do that. You were Jesus' number one. You were his guy, his boy. Why'd you do him like that? You are a terrible friend, the worst disciple. You will never be a leader. No one would ever follow you. Jesus would never forgive you for what you've done. And even if he does, how could you live with yourself? We've said things like that, right? We've felt things like that. It feels familiar. And I believe this word is for some of us uh, here today. And I believe that God wants to set you free from something. You cannot change your past, but God can change your future. And we do this by receiving God's forgiveness, being set free, and then agreeing with God about who he says we are. First, let's talk about what forgiveness is not. 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So forgiveness is not pretending it didn't happen. It's not forgetting. It's not acting like it wasn't a big deal. 
We don't pretend. It's okay to not be okay. It's not okay to pretend. So we bring our stuff into the light and we own it. It's not ignoring my sin. It's dealing with my sin in love and the safety and the goodness of my Savior. That's what forgiveness is. And when I'm close enough to Jesus to hear what he says about me, he reminds me who I am. And he reminds me it's not what I've done. It's who I am. I'm not my sin. Yes, I did sin, but I'm not my sin. I'm not defined by shame. And John continues in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, if we bring our sin into the light, God is faithful and just and will forgive us for our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It moves us forward. Here's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is releasing my hope for a better past. Forgiveness is releasing my hope for a better past because hope always leans forward. Hope always looks to the future. Hope does not live in the past. If you are placing your hope in a better past, you will be disappointed, you will be angry, you will live in shame and regret, and there's death there. God wants you to let go of the past. It, it, it happens. You can't change it. But God, if, if we let go of our hope for a better past, we can begin to embrace the power of Jesus for a better future. That's the only way that we can do that. We have a God who says you've beaten yourself up enough. He wants you to move on. He's giving you the gift of a better future through forgiveness. And when you say, I know God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Not only are we going to stay stuck in the past, but we're going to refuse to accept God's gift of a better future. Here's what happens next with Peter. I love this story. So, so in John chapter 21, I'm not going to read the scripture. I'm going to summarize it, but please go back and read John chapter 21 because I, I love what happens here. It's, it's really cool. Um, but So Jesus has died, has been resurrected, and now Peter has gone back to what's comfortable. He's fishing again. It's not wrong. It's just he just went back to what's comfortable. So, so he's fishing, and Jesus appears on the shoreline, and Peter sees him, gets so excited, and he doesn't even row the boat in. He just jumps out of the boat and swims to the shoreline and embraces Jesus. It's such a cool moment. And then they have a meal together. The last meal that they had together was where Jesus said to Peter, you're going to deny me three times, but you will get back up, and you're going to strengthen your brothers. And so at this meal, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, absolutely, I love you, Jesus. And Jesus is like, okay, feed my sheep. And then a second time, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, absolutely, I absolutely love you, Jesus. He's like, okay, take care of my sheep. And then a third time, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, you know everything. You know everything about me. You've seen my worst. You've seen my best. You know who I am. Yes, I love you. And Jesus says, all right, take care of my sheep. Also, it's going to be really hard. And in one moment, Jesus forgives Peter, restores him, brings him new life, and then sets him into purpose and sets him into calling. So you see, Jesus didn't say those three things to him because Jesus needed to be healed from, from that, that, that interaction. Jesus didn't do it for himself. He did that for Peter because Peter needed that moment. And in one moment, he moves from, in, into forgiveness and out of shame and into his purpose. And, and Peter gets this. Look at what Peter writes later in his life. So he's been leading the church for a long time. He's probably seen so many people to come to Jesus that he's lost track of how many. And he writes this in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen people. Say chosen. You are a royal priesthood. Say royal. You are a holy nation. Say holy. And now tell, you, tell your neighbor this. You are God's special possession. It was a little weird, wasn't it? Yeah. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You are chosen. You are royal. Peter knew that he couldn't pretend anymore. He couldn't stay in darkness anymore. So he stepped into light, all of him into light. He was vulnerable. He was exposed. He knew that it was okay to not be okay, that he was safe with his God, with his Savior. And he brought all of his worst stuff with him, knowing I am not my sin. 
But Jesus, if I'm going to be healed from this, I need to hand it to you. I need to give it to you to to step out of darkness and step into light. Because we're not going to be stuck in denial. We're not going to pretend. Psychologist Dr. Brene Brown said this, shame needs three things to grow. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. You felt those things before? But the antidote to shame is empathy. It's someone who sees you, who knows you, who knows what you've gone through, who sees what you're walking through, has felt what you felt, who steps into it with you and is present with you. And our Lord does that. Our Lord has joined us, knows everything that we've ever done and still calls us, still knows who we are. So we have to step out of darkness to be exposed and be vulnerable, not so that we could be punished or condemned or judged, but so that we could be forgiven, healed, and then step into purpose. You see, we don't live in shame anymore. We've stepped out of shame into our new identity as a child of God. You are a daughter. You are a son of the Most High God. You are chosen. God has chosen you, hand-picked you, You are royal. What that means is that you, because you belong to God, because you are a son of daughter or the most high king, you have access to everything that he has access to. You are a priesthood. You are a priest, which means that you don't have to go through anybody else. You have direct access to the God of the universe. You are holy. And that means that you are set apart for special purpose. You are not ordinary. You are set apart for special purpose. And this is my favorite. You are God's special possession. Because we don't belong to sin and shame anymore. We belong to our Father. Amen? Over the last couple weeks, I've had the opportunity, multiple opportunities, uh, to ask for forgiveness. Um, First, it started uh, with my wife, who who said to me, you know, Mike, you're you're being kind of critical. Um, you're criticizing me a lot. You're criticizing the kids a lot. And I would love to say that I responded so well. Um, but I didn't. I responded with defensiveness. Who, <laughs> me? No, that's ridiculous. I'm, that's not who I am. I don't do those things. And then I get into the office. Um, and four or five people gave me similar feedback. You know, Mike, you're acting, acting really critical. You're, um, the way that you say those, those things, it, it sounds really criticizing. Oh, okay. And then Pastor Dan pulls me into his office, and he gives me some feedback. And he says, Mike, I, I know you, and I love you, and I know this isn't who you are, but the way that you're saying these things sounds critical. And, it's, and I, know, I know this isn't in your heart, but it you're kind of devaluing people. And I know you don't do that on purpose, but that's, that's the effect of what you're doing. And now I have a choice. Now that my stuff has been exposed, do I respond with denial? Do I respond with defensiveness or anger or start pointing figures? Well, well, they did, and that's why I did it. Or do I respond with humility? It's like, yeah, I, that's, a, that's a blind spot and I need to work on that. And then I went back to all those people and I started to ask for forgiveness. I'm really sorry that I've done this. I did not mean to hurt you in this way. How can I, how can I say things better? How can I word things better? Because that is not my heart. And because we all love each other, they were amazing conversations. They were so good and we're better for it. And I don't, I don't know if you've, if, if this is hard, like hard working with other people because like I'm perfect and, and, and you too, or I'm not perfect rather, and you're not perfect either. And then we try to do stuff together and it's just, it's hard because God's not done with me yet, but we're all growing. And so now we're living in a space of forgiveness, but now I have a harder work to do because it's so easy for me to slip into this temptation, to slip back into shame. But yeah, I, I was I was critical to, to my wife. I was critical to my kids. I was critical to my, my coworkers. Am I a bad husband? Am I a bad father? Am I a bad pastor? Oh my. That's not what God wants for me. See, guilt says I did bad, but shame says I am bad, but I am not bad. I am not the worst thing I've ever done. I am not my sin. I am a child of God. 
And then I get to step into those situations open-handed and let the light shine on my sin because I know that I'm actually safe. Because my identity is secure. Nothing has changed with who I am. And God gets to grow me. And we get to all step into that together. Would you bow your heads with me? Bow your heads with me all across this room. And if you're watching at home online with your family or with your small group, uh, would you bow your heads as well? If you're in a car, do not do this. Maybe for some of us today, we need to make that very first step of stepping out of shame and into who Jesus says we are and declare my life belongs to God. I give him everything. I am all in. I'm making Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. Or maybe today you made that decision a long time ago, but you've kind of gone and done your own thing. You've slipped away from that. Maybe you're following Jesus, but at a distance. And you've slipped back into living in shame. And today is the day you're rededicating your life to him. So if you want to make that decision today, what we do in this room is we raise our hand. It's a physical indication of a spiritual decision that says, yes, that's me. I'm all in. If you want to make that decision and you're joining us online, uh, press that button that's coming up on your screen right now. Press that button right there. It's a physical physical act of a spiritual decision that says, that's me. I'm all in. So if you're going to make that decision today, to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, would you just raise your hand up high and say, that's me, I am all in, I am giving God everything. Yes, yes. Who else? I go ahead and lower your hands. And if you raised your hands uh, or, or raise your hands online, would you pray this prayer with me? Father God, I give you everything. I give you my life. I give you my sin, my shame, my guilt. God, you can have it all. And I know that you see everything, God. You've seen everything that I ever have ever done, God. And I ask your forgiveness. God, and I receive your forgiveness. And I'm going to step out of shame and step into life and step into the identity of who you say I am. And you call me daughter. You call me son. And I'm so excited to walk in this new journey with you of life and growth and transformation and purpose. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Hey, give God a hand.